Ever thought about why there's a British Columbia in a District of Columbia? Could there be a historical tie? Here's a fascinating twist. The U.S. once had substantial claims over British Columbia, and most of its early white settlers were Americans. The name Columbia is actually an alternate name for the United States, much like Persia is an alternate name for Iran. This is why the capital of the United States, Washington, is located in the District of Columbia. Conversely, British Columbia literally means the part of Columbia or America that was under British control. A glance at different maps from the 19th century shows the different territorial claims at the time. One published in the UK would show British holdings extending deep into present-day Oregon, while the French version, the country that, you know, helped America free itself from London in 1776 and gifted the Statue of Liberty, would show US holdings stretching well into modern British Columbia. Ultimately, a treaty would be signed that was seen as an even trade. The US gave up its claim to British Columbia, and the UK relinquished its claim to the Oregon Territory. Intrigued? Let's dive into this historical swap that shaped North America's borders. This is our deep dive into one of the most transformative periods in American history, the era of U.S. expansion, manifest destiny, and the 1848 Mexican-American War. Picture a time when the United States was a young, ambitious nation, bursting at the seams with a desire to expand its territory and influence across the continent. This drive was fueled by a powerful belief known as Manifest Destiny. Manifest Destiny, a term first coined by magazine editor John L. Sullivan in 1845, was the 19th century doctrine that Providence destined the United States to expand across North America. This belief wasn't just about the land, it was about spreading democracy, capitalism, and American ideals from the Atlantic to the Pacific even if some of the native people already living there happened to be less interested in having these ideas spread to them. The vision of a continental nation pushed American settlers, politicians, and soldiers to venture into uncharted territories, driven by the conviction that it was their divine right and duty. One of the most significant chapters in this expansionist saga was the Mexican-American War of 1846 to 1848. Sparked by a border dispute following the annexation of Texas, this conflict was a turning point in American history. The war ended with the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, which forced Mexico to cede a vast portion of its northern territories to the United States. This acquisition included present-day California, Nevada, Utah, Arizona, New Mexico, Colorado, Wyoming, and Texas, drastically expanding the U.S. map and paving the way for the nation's westward growth. We'll get into some of the similarities between Texas and Oregon later though. But this rapid expansion wasn't without controversy. The war and the concept of manifest destiny ignited intense debates over issues like slavery, indigenous rights, and the moral implications of imperialism. The dream of a coast-to-coast -coast America came at a high cost, reshaping the nation's demographic, political, and cultural landscapes. Let's set the scene. The Oregon Territory, stretching from the Pacific Coast to the Rocky Mountains, covered what is now Oregon, Washington, and most of British Columbia. It was a land rich with resources and strategic importance. Everyone wanted a piece of it. Originally, Spain, Great Britain, Russia, and the United States all laid claim to this vast region. In 1819, under the Transcontinental Treaty, Spain ceded its claims to the U.S., but that was just the beginning. Russia attempted to monopolize fishing, whaling, and trade from the Bering Straits to the 51st parallel, prompting President Monroe to declare his famous doctrine in 1823, warning Russia to back off. The U.S. based its claim on the explorations of Lewis and Clark and trading posts established by John Jacob Astor's Pacific Fur Company, like Astoria at the mouth of the Columbia River. Great Britain, on the other hand, leaned on James Cook's exploration of the Columbia River to stake its claim. By 1818, British and American commissioners had fixed the U.S.-Canada border at the 49th parallel from the Lake of the Woods to the Rocky Mountains. The U.S. wanted to extend this line to the Pacific, but Britain insisted it follow the Columbia River. They agreed to postpone the decision, and in 1827, they postponed it indefinitely, pending one year's notice from either side. Fast forward to the 1840s, 
and American settlers were pouring into the Oregon Territory via the Oregon Trail. The rallying cry, 54 degrees, 40 year or fight, echoed through Congress. President James Polk, a staunch supporter of Manifest Destiny, aimed to settle the boundary once and for all, proposing the 49th parallel as a compromise. Speaking of the Oregon Trail, let's talk about the Great Emigration of 1843. Imagine a wagon train of around 1,000 settlers making the perilous journey westward, led by figures like John Gant and Dr. Elijah White. This group braved river crossings, rugged mountains, and the constant threat of attacks. Their successful journey demonstrated the feasibility of large-scale migration and encouraged thousands more to follow. In fact, if we think about the Mexican-American War before Texas declared its independence from Mexico in 1836, it was flooded with Anglo-American settlers who had been invited by the Mexican government to populate and develop the region. The influx of these settlers, who brought with them their own customs, governance ideas, and a strong desire for autonomy, quickly outnumbered the local Mexican population. This demographic shift, coupled with cultural and political clashes, set the stage for the Texas Revolution and the eventual annexation of Texas by the United States. A similar scenario could have easily unfolded in British Columbia. The region was ripe for a demographic transformation with American settlers already pouring into the Oregon Territory and pushing further north. If left unchecked, this wave of settlers could have dramatically altered the cultural and political landscape of British Columbia, potentially leading to a push for annexation similar to what happened in Texas. Britain's strategic decision to compromise and negotiate the boundary was in part to prevent such a scenario, ensuring that British Columbia remained under their control and influence. That way, Britain ensured there would be no repeat of the Battle of the Alamo with snow in Vancouver. Now here's where it gets really interesting. Britain, realizing it couldn't win a war with the Americans on the North American continent, decided to play the long game and clearly had learned from the mistakes of King George in the 18th century. Enlightened ambassadors like British Minister Richard Pakenham and Secretary of State James Buchanan, supported by British Foreign Secretary Lord Aberdeen and Senator John C. Calhoun, worked out a deal. They agreed to Polk's suggestion with a few tweaks, like reserving Vancouver Island for Canada. On June 18, 1846, the Senate ratified the treaty, setting the border at the 49th parallel. But why did Britain agree to this? It turns out they saw the growth of the U.S. as an opportunity for British businesses. Rather than being at war, they figured trading with the booming American economy was a better deal. Plus, it helped drive a wedge between the U.S. and their European rivals, France and Spain. By ceding the Northwest Territory to the U.S., Britain avoided entanglements with other powers in North America. France eventually sold the Louisiana Territory to the U.S., and Spain gave up on Florida, unable to find gold there. There was also a darker side to Oregon becoming part of the UD. One of the most pivotal days in Oregon's history occurred before the state of Oregon even existed. The state officially joined the Union in 1859, but a significant event happened nine years earlier that set the stage for its future. On September 27, 1850, the Donation Land Claim Act became law, marking a critical turning point in the region's history. The Donation Land Claim Act allowed white settlers, and only white settlers, to claim 320-acre parcels of land in the Oregon Territory, which included present-day Oregon, Washington, Idaho, and parts of Wyoming. Married couples could get double that amount, 640 acres, or a full square mile of land free of charge. The impact was staggering. In 1849, there were only about 9,000 European Americans in what is now Oregon. By 1860, that number had swelled to 50,000. However, this influx of settlers came at a tremendous cost to the indigenous peoples who had lived on these lands for thousands of years. By 1855, just five years after the act was signed, settlers had claimed 2.8 million acres of land belonging to indigenous tribes. This mass displacement of native peoples is a dark chapter in the history of Oregon that was often omitted from history books and classrooms until only recently. In the early days of the Oregon Territory, the relationship between indigenous tribes and white settlers was relatively amicable. Tribes worked alongside settlers, adopting some of their customs 
and integrating into the new economy by taking jobs and learning new skills. This cooperative spirit, however, was shattered once the Donation Land Claim Act came into effect. Despite earlier agreements, such as the Northwest Ordinance of 1787, which stated that Native people's lands and property should never be taken without their consent, the new law enabled white male citizens to claim vast tracts of land, disregarding indigenous rights entirely. By 1851, the fertile Willamette Valley had been entirely claimed by white settlers, leaving many Native tribes in a precarious position. They found themselves living on land that now belonged to others, their traditional ways of life disrupted by the settlers' farms and livestock, which destroyed their food sources. The settlers' farming practices plowed up fields where Native people grew their crops, and the introduction of cattle and pigs further decimated these vital resources. With their food sources depleted, many indigenous tribes were forced to beg or steal from the settlers, actions that were harshly condemned and punished. Realizing the grave mistake of allowing so many settlers into their lands, Native tribes saw their options dwindle. They had not anticipated the sheer volume of settlers and the speed at which they would occupy their lands. Some tribes attempted to adapt by negotiating treaties, often driving hard bargains for their land in a desperate attempt to salvage something from the rapidly changing landscape. A Malala chief known as Crooked Finger, for example, insisted on receiving immediate payment for his land, aware that delayed payments would be meaningless in his lifetime. As indigenous tribes were relocated to reservations, many continued to return to their traditional lands to work for white settlers. This practice established the first indigenous farm labor force in Oregon, a system that persisted well into the 20th century. Even today, the effects of these early land policies are felt. For instance, the Warm Springs Treaty of 1865, which restricted tribal members' ability to travel off the reservation to hunt, fish, and forage, was only recently nullified by the U.S. Congress. The legacy of these treaties in the Donation Land Claim Act illustrates the long-lasting impact of the early settlement policies on indigenous communities. Treaties remain the supreme law of the land, and their potential enforcement could still influence the lives of indigenous people today. The darker side of the Oregon Purchase is a stark reminder of the cost of westward expansion and the profound injustices faced by Native peoples. And so there you have it. The Oregon Territory's fate was sealed through a mix of bold diplomacy, strategic foresight, and the relentless drive of manifest destiny with its often devastating effects on Native American tribes. Next time you look at a map, remember the intense negotiations and power plays that shaped these borders. American territorial expansion would continue for many decades after the acquisition of Oregon, as the U.S. would buy Alaska from Russia in the 1860s and take former colonies like the Philippines, Puerto Rico, Guam, and Cuba from the Spanish after crushing them in the 1898 Spanish-American War. One of the last and most interesting territorial acquisitions would be the U.S. purchase of the Virgin Islands from Denmark. And if you'd like to learn more about that, check out our video on the subject link below.